Okay, so Mr. Troncoso will speak on classification of semi-simple Lie algebras. All right, good afternoon, professors. Uh, Zach, Steve. Uh, I'm here to talk about, as Professor Mohan just said, classification of semi-simple Lie algebras and tell you all about them. So, our objective for this talk will be, given an arbitrary finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra L, we want to be able to fully describe its isomorphism in class. Uh, that mean, basically means that if, I, if you give me a semi-simple algebra L, I want to be able to give you an example uh, that is completely isomorphic to that semi-simple algebra. So to start things off, I'd like to define what uh, Lie algebra is. Uh, if we let F be a field, uh, Lie algebra over F is an F vector space L together with a uh, bilinear form, bilinear map called the Lie bracket from L cross L to L that takes the element x comma y and l cross l and brings it to x bracket y. And we have a couple of axioms that define what this, what this Lie bracket is. We have uh, the Lie bracket of anything with itself is always zero. And then we have this odd relationship here called Jacobi identity. It is actually a measurement of the Lie bracket's failure to associate. Uh, from here we can get another, another relationship called anti-commutativity, uh, which means x bracket y is equal to negative y bracket x, and anything bracketed with zero is zero. So a couple examples just to start things off. So you know what Lie algebra is. Our first one would be R3 uh, endowed with the cross product. Uh, the cross product actually fits the definition of Lie bracket. We see this because the cross product of any element with itself is always zero, and you can, you can check to make sure that the Jacobi identity holds. Another would be the general, the general linear algebra which is a space of linear maps from V into V with V a vector space. And we give the Lie bracket for that. We get X composed of Y minus Y composed of X. And that's actually a measurement of X and Y's failure to commute. That's another way to look at the Lie bracket. And if we choose a basis, instead of looking at GLV as linear maps, we can look at it as matrices. Uh, and we call that GLMC. Uh, I changed the field F to C. Uh, we'll be working over the complex numbers for most of this talk because we need the existence of eigenvectors in our classification. And once again, we have x bracket y instead of composition. We have matrix multiplication, and we generally refer to this as the commutator because of its value to commute. Uh, one specific example I'd like to actually talk about real quick, take a moment, is the special linear algebra. And this is linear algebra SL2C. So it's three-dimensional linear algebra. It's a subspace of GL2C. And it is the space of two by two matrices with trace zero. And trace being the sum of the diagonal, the diagonal elements. And we can define a basis for this based on this fact. First element would be E. And these fit a very distinct Lie bracket relationship amongst the space elements. Uh, e bracket F will actually give you H. <coughs> H bracketed with E will give you 2E. And H bracketed with F will actually give you negative 2F. And you can check that any uh, three dimensional Lie algebra that actually fits this relationship of Lie brackets will always be isomorphic to SL2C. And we call that the, the special linear algebra. Okay, so it'd be nice to actually know what a semi-simple Lie algebra is. So I'd like to define that for everybody. Uh, we say that a Lie algebra is semi-simple if it has no solvable ideals. Um, we don't actually have time to discuss from this definition what it means, and almost half of my paper actually dealt with moving from this definition of a semi-simple Lie algebra this definition, meaning that some simple Lie algebra is a direct sum of simple Lie algebra. And for the purpose of this talk, we'll be using this as our, our baseline. So uh, from here, we'd like to know what a simple Lie algebra is. And we can find that here. Uh, we say Lie algebra L is simple if it has no non-trivial ideals, and it is not a billion. Uh, the restriction to it not being a billion is because it, if we have an abelian Lie algebra 
say the one-dimensional Leandra, it would actually be simple, but not semi-simple. That's a little undesirable. So I said that a simple Leandra is something that has no non-trivial ideals, so it would be nice to know what an ideal is. Uh, we start with what a subalgebra is, so that would be a vector subspace K of L, which is uh, at least a Lie algebra in its own right, and it's closed on the Lie bracket. So for any two elements in K, you take the Lie bracket to stay in K. An ideal is a little bit stronger. It is also a subalgebra. So for any two elements in I, you, you stay in I. But also, it absorbs elements in L. So the, when you take the Lie bracket of something uh, with Y and I are ideal, and X and L are, are Lie algebra, you stay in I. And ideals uh, are very inherent to the structure of a Lie algebra, as you can tell. We actually define a simple Lie algebra based on ideals. And our trivial ideals are L in itself. So if you have a simple Lie algebra, those are its only ideals. Okay, we want to be able to, to give an isomorphism class for a semi simple Lie algebra. So it makes sense to actually talk about what a homomorphism of Lie algebra is. Uh, essentially, the same thing as what you would expect for a vector space homomorphism which is extra property that it preserves the Lie bracket. So phi of bracket x, y is equal to bracket phi of x comma phi of y for all x and y and l. And then our next two properties, isomorphism is the same as if it's, if our homomorphism is bijective, it's also an isomorphism, and the kernel image are the same as you would expect for vector spaces. Okay. This is our actually most important homomorphism. We call it the adjoint homomorphism. It is a homomorphism that takes something in X and sends it to a linear map in GL of L, which is the linear map of spaces of functions that go from L into itself. So the adjoint homomorphism takes an element X in L and sends it to add X. And add X is a linear map that takes an element in Y and sends it to X bracket Y. And you can actually check it, it, it fits the bill for a homomorphism because when you check the property, it actually falls out as the Jacobi identity. Back to a, a couple more examples so you can understand what subalgebras and ideals are. Uh, the space of upper triangular matrices is a specific one. It's actually a solvable Lie algebra, and I will not have time to talk about it today, but these two matrices play a very large role in building up to that theorem that semi-simple Lie algebras are a direct sum of simple Lie algebras because you can represent all solvable Lie algebras as upper triangular and all Neil-Cohen Lie algebras as strictly upper triangular. And those are sub-algebras of our general linear space. Next one, back to SL2C. It is an ideal of GL2C. And we can check this pretty easily. Uh, if we have XY, in GL2C, and we take bracket xy, this is equal to xy minus by x. Now we define the special linear algebra to be the space of two by two matrices with trace zero. So we want to take the trace of this, this guy. And we see that the trace of xy minus yx falls out. is actually a very specific ideal. We call it the derived algebra because you can write SL2C as bracket GL2C itself. Uh, back to homomorphisms. Uh, we want to look at the kernel and the image. It will also be the common roles. And the kernel of phi is always an ideal of L1, and the image of phi is always an ideal, it's not an ideal, I'm sorry, it's always a subalgebra of L2. And that comes just from the definition of their sets. Okay, so recall, a simple Lie algebra has no non trivial ideals. So we're going to look at the adjoint homomorphism on a simple Lie algebra. So if we take add from L to GL of L for L simple, and we look at the kernel. Now, since it has no non-trivial ideals, and the kernel is always an ideal, we know that the kernel 
of add of this homomorphism for a simple Lie algebra will be zero. And this means that L is actually isomorphic to its homomorphic image under the adjoint homomorphism. A little bit of a mouthful, and so we just call it add L. So now, instead of looking at simple Lie algebras, we can actually reduce our study to subalgebras of GL of L, specifically under this adjoint homomorphism. And just a, a recap, we know the semi-simple Lie algebras shifts our focus to, and the classification to simple Lie algebras. We can classify all of them. Then we know what semi-simple Lie algebras look like. And because of this relationship between simple Lie algebras and the adjoint homomorphism, we shift our focus once again from simple Lie algebras to subalgebras of GL of L. And simple flow chart, semi-simple to simple to L subalgebra of GL of L. So going off of the subalgebras of GL of L, I like to define a very specific decomposition for our semi-simple Lie algebra. This is called the root space decomposition. And it's based off of uh, our Carton subalgebra H. Uh, H is a, very, is a very specific subalgebra of L. It is composed solely of semi-simple elements, meaning that it is their diagonalizable elements. And it's also a billion. And that always exists in a semi-simple Lie algebra. Uh, I could show you by quick just thought process. Um, if every element in L was actually, uh, if there was no semi-simple elements in L, it would just be the element. So we need the existence of at least one, meaning we have at least one sort of Carton subalgebra. And then we like to define these, these alpha, these are eigenfunctions, and they're in elements of the dual space of H, and they go from the linear maps from H into the complex number. <coughs> and we rewrite L alpha and H, which are Sorry, which are actually eigenspaces of the adjoint representation of H. So these are all I, these are all all the elements in these spaces are actually eigenvectors for at H, and they fall out from these eigenfunctions, which give us our root space. And we call phi the space of all these eigenfunctions our root space. It's a subset of the dual space. Now, this is actually not. A uh, simple, simple decomposition because the L alphas are one dimensional. Each one only has one eigenvector, so they themselves are not simple. However, we can actually use our root space decomposition as a roadmap to find simple Lie algebras nested within our semi simple one. Uh, that is to say, inside every semi simple Lie algebra, you can find subalgebras isomorphic to SL2C. Uh, if you find, you can actually take from here, my base vectors E, F, and H. There is an element E related to L, L sub alpha. There is an element F related to L minus alpha. And H would actually be in the Carton subalgebra. And those are embedded within our semi simple Lie algebra. So because these guys are not simple, our focus is on the root space, our, our eigenfunctions. Also, the, the root space is actually unique up to isomorphism, because every Carton subalgebra or semi simple Lie algebra will actually be similar to each other. And we like to look at these root spaces as a root system, which is in and of itself another topic in mathematics we'd like to delve into. So we define a root system to be a subset uh, of phi, a finite dimensional Euclidean space, which is a finite real vector space with a positive definite inner product, satisfying the following. Our first axiom, phi is finite, it spans our Euclidean space, and zero is not an element in phi. Next, the only scalar multiples of an element in phi are plus or minus, or plus or minus alpha, and that's it, nothing else. Next, we have this, this odd relationship, which is with pointing bracket beta, pointing bracket alpha, which is related to the angles between, between roots, and it has to be an integer. And next, this is actually this actually tells us that our roots are closed through reflection on our other roots. So these, all four of these axioms severely restrict the, the various possibilities for our root system. And we see this when we try to define all the root systems of R2 with the Euclidean uh, inner product. So we start with alpha and beta orthogonal. You get, you get this root system, we call it type A1 cross, cross A1. If you have alpha and beta, and they're of the same length, 
or you actually get A2. Uh, this is alpha and beta, and beta is now, now twice the length of alpha. And you get B2. Uh, twice? Or two times? or uh, It's proportional, I'm sorry. So beta is related to twice the length of alpha. If you look at it, if you look at this, alpha alpha would actually, I'm sorry, beta beta would equal be to two alpha alpha. Uh, another way of looking at it is the angle between the, the two roots would be three pi over four. And the last one is G2, uh, the angle between those roots would be five pi over six. And those are the only root systems for, for R2. Now the root space, which we discussed earlier in our root space decomposition, actually forms a root system if you look at the killing form as our inner product. And we define the killing form to be this relationship. Uh, it would be the trace of add x composed with add y. We get add x of linear maps. Uh, we can represent these as matrices, though, if we just choose a basis. And in that sense, the trace makes sense looking at the sum of its diagonal entries. Uh, every root system has a base. Uh, we call those the simple roots. So if you look back at how we define uh, the root systems of R2, they're all linear combinations of alpha and beta. So in this case, alpha and beta would be our simple roots. OK, so we have semi-simple and simple, and now we have these root systems. And it'd be really nice if with two are isomorphic and the other two are isomorphic. It actually turns out if you have two semi-simple root systems that are isomorphic, that's infinitely if their respective root systems are isomorphic. And then we also have that Lie algebra is simple if and only if its root system is irreducible. And to say that a root system is irreducible, that means that it can't be represented as a disjoint union of two mutually perpendicular root systems. Okay, so once again, looking at our progression of the classification. So semi-simple Lie algebras have unique root systems, meaning we want to look at root systems. And then simple Lie algebras being irreducible root systems, meaning that if we can classify all irreducible root systems, we can classify all simple, and in turn classify all semi-simple. So we move from sub of GLB to looking at the root space decomposition and giving the root space, so we have root systems and irreducible root systems. Now for irreducible root systems, we want to be able to succinctly describe all the properties, and to do that, we look at a graph, a very specific graph called the Dinkin diagram. The Dinkin diagram of root system of rank N is defined to be a graph with n vertices labeled by the simple roots and with edges given as follows. And the edges are related to the length and angle relationships between the roots. So we have a single edge connecting uh, root alpha i and alpha j. If they are the same length and not orthogonal, there's a single edge connecting those two vertices. If we have a, we have a double edge, if they're once again not orthogonal, and alpha j is twice the length of alpha i, and a triple edge similarly. Okay, so recall, uh, we have the root systems are defined axiomatically based on those, those four axioms. They're finite, uh, scalar multiples are only plus or minus. Uh, this relationship between the angles uh, of the roots, they're, they're integers, and it's closed under reflection. So the Dinkin diagram is to pick the angle and length relationships of the simple roots from the underlying root system. Meaning that the Dinkin diagrams are isomorphic if and only if the underlying root systems are isomorphic. So we can, and we can use the axioms of root systems to classify our Dinkin diagrams. They're highly restrictive, which means we don't expect a lot of different types of Dinkin diagrams to be able to form from these axioms. So our first one, looking at once again, SL, instead of SL2C, but its entire family of special linear algebras, which would be SLL plus one comma C, you actually get this type of Dinkin diagram. Um, all the, uh, all the vertices share similar length, and we have L related to the dimension. And we have a, a next one would be SL, SO, 2L plus 1 comma C. This is, uh, this is the odd dimensional orthogonal algebras, and these are skew symmetric matrices. And we get type EL for L greater than 2. Uh, that's because that will come up later based on isomorphisms. But the main topic is this last root is of a different length than the rest of these get that double edge at the end. We have the symplectic linear algebra. This is CL for L greater than 3. And notice that for L equal to 2, these guys are actually isomorphic, which is why we have this distinction here. 
in terms of dimension. And the last one are the even orthogonal linear address. And that's D sub L, this family. Um, we have here L greater than equal to 4 because if L is equal to 2, we would just get this guy here, which would be the same as A sub 2. And for D sub 3, we actually get A sub 3. So those are, those are also isomorphic. So this, is, this doesn't become a unique taken diagram until L is greater than equal to 4, and we have this, this branch vertex here, meaning that it's incident to three edges and multiple different vertices. Our last one are these, these five. Uh, refer to these, these four as the classical uh, linear algebras. And there's also five more. The, the exceptional linear algebras correspond to five exceptional thinking values. I won't be discussing these in depth for this talk. I don't necessarily have the time, but you can generate them based on extending basis from the other linear algebras. And we actually gave a representation of G2 in R2 with the Euclidean. So that completes our, our classification of all irreducible thinking diagrams. Um, they're in a one-to-one -one correspondence with all simple Liadras, up to isomorphism. And simple Liadras are our building blocks of semi-simple Liadras. And that finishes it up. We now know exactly how to describe every simple Liadra, so we know how to describe every semi-simple Liadra. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, I use Urban Williams' introduction of Liadras. Uh, Professor Goose, Professor Henry's respective notes online, and my honor advisor, Professor Munson. Any questions? <laughs>